Smith and several folks who are not involved in Sunday School who are here. Um, and so glad that you'll be a part of this little three-week study. Um, if you're not in Sunday School class, I just encourage you, visit around different classes and see which one has a good feel for you. But it's good to come to church, and then it's good to go to Sunday School where you can talk and discuss and hear other things. It's, it's a, a real healthy thing to do. Our focus is on the heart that grew three sizes, the story of the Grinch that stole Christmas. I like this kind of thing because it helps us to see that we can see messages from the Lord, of course, in Holy Scripture, but sometimes even in secular things like the Grinch that stole Christmas. And these stories, these songs, these, this artwork, different ways God can speak to us and remind us of truths in the gospel. So I'm, I'm so thankful for that. Chad, on behalf of everyone, thank you for your helping us out. Uh, so if you'd look at your handout, and we'll join together in our opening prayer. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for this time together to study your word. We pray that during this season of Advent, of waiting and anticipation, you would expand our hearts to better know you and better love you. Thank you for going before us and guiding us as we desire to draw closer to your heart. May we benefit from the wisdom of your people and your word. Amen. This study is written by a pastor friend of mine. His name is Matt Rawl, and he's the pastor of Asbury United Methodist Church in Bossier City. And he's had several different studies like this. Um, he did one on the Charles Dickens story um, about Christmas and Scrooge that we did as a church-wide study a few years ago. And everyone liked that, so I thought we would give this a whirl about the Grinch that stole Christmas. Now, so often when people think about the Grinch that stole Christmas, they think of the movie, The Grinch that Stole Christmas. Who's seen the movie with uh, Jim Carrey? Who's seen the little 30-minute movie that came out in 1967? And who is the narrator, you remember? I thought it was Boris Karloff. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, he didn't sing in there, but he narrated it. Okay. Uh, the Grinch That Stole Christmas, it's touched and it's influenced lives uh, for many, many years since it came out in 1967. Uh, written by Dr. Seuss, but you know his real name? Ted Geisel, or Theodore Geisel. Um, he set out to tell this story, this Christmas story, that kind of pushes against the mainstream. Uh, he wanted to avoid sentimental moralism. And in the process, he developed a character who became synonymous with greed and mischief and a huge distaste for all things Christmas. Um, he began to understand that this story was somewhat autobiographical, that the story of the Grinch that stole Christmas was really kind of a story about his own life because he was not a big fan of Christmas. And so he wrote this story about it. I have a little quiz. For us. I want to see how well we do with this, and I think we'll do pretty well. Um, I think there are 10 questions. First question is this, where does the story of the Grinch take place? There are four options. I'm going to tell you the four, and then we'll vote on which one. Fort Knox, Whoville, the North Pole, Catru. Who says it's in Fort Knox? Who says it's in Whoville? Who says it's in the North Pole? Who says it's in Catru? Wherever that is. The answer is Whoville. Where did the Grinch get his Santa suit? His Santa suit. Four options. He bought it at the mall. He stole it from the real Santa Claus. His mother made it for him. He made it for himself. Who says he bought it at the mall? Says he stole it from the real Santa Claus. His mother made it for him. He made it for himself. That is correct. Y'all are doing great. In one part of the book, the Grinch mentioned his age. This one will get you. What was it? Here are the options. 41 years old, 53 years old, 30 years old, 65 years old. Who says 41? Was that a yes? Kind of. Didn't even... <laughs> Who says 53? Who says 30? Who says 65? Who says I don't have a clue? <laughs> the answer is 53. Question four. While he was stealing a household's Christmas tree, the Grinch tricked a little girl into thinking he was Santa Claus. Who is this little girl? Here are the options. Sandy Lou Who, Samantha Who, Emily Lou, 
Cindy Lou Who. All right, who votes for Sandy Lou Who? Who votes for Samantha Who? Feel pretty strongly? Yeah, okay. Who votes for Emily Who? Who votes for Cindy Lou Who? Wow, Cindy Lou Who. In what part of Whoville did the Grinch live? You may struggle with this. North, underground, south, east. Who says north? Who says underground? Who says south? Who says east? The answer is north. Only a few left, but y'all are doing average. <laughs> in the north, though. There's something the Grinch left in the house as he stole from. He left behind something. What was it? Crumbs too small for their mouses? The log for their fire? The stockings? The roast beef? Who says crumbs too small for their mouses? Who says the log for their fire? Who says the stockings? Who says the roast beef? The answer is crumbs too small for their mouses. They didn't leave much. Where was, number seven, where was the Grinch going to dump all of the Who's items? Who says, into the River Wahoo. Off, well, we're going to do all four. Into the River Wahoo, off of Mount Crumpet, off the Bungle Bung Bridge, off of City Hall. Who says, into the River Wahoo? Who says, off of Mount Crumpet? Who says, off the Bungle Bung Bridge? Who says, off of City Hall? The answer is, off of Mount Crumpet. That's where he lived. The Grinch had brought his dog, Max, along with him as a mock reindeer. What kind of animal was Max? These are the options. Dog, horse, cat, donkey. Who says a dog? Who says a horse? Who says a cat? Who says a donkey? Answer is a dog. Only two left. What did the Who's do when they saw all their Christmas-themed items were stolen? They threw the Grinch in jail, they began to cry, they began to sing, they formed an angry mob. Who says they threw the Grinch in jail? Who says they began to cry? Who says they started to sing? Who says they formed an angry mob? Answer is they started to sing. And then the last question, what happened after the Grinch heard how the Who's responded to their loss of their Christmas items? He cried, his heart grew three sizes, he joined in the singing, he went back home. Who says he cried? Who says his heart grew three sizes? Who says he joined in the singing? Who says he went back home? The answer is his heart grew three sizes. Y'all did very well in this. Um, proud of, of your knowledge of the, the Grinch that stole Christmas. Um, the story, just a, a quick little summation goes like this. I'm going to read this kind of quickly, just a few paragraphs, just to remind you of the story. The Grinch is a grouchy, solitary creature with a heart two sizes too small. He resides in a cave on Mount Crumpet, a steep mountain north of Whoville, home of the cheerful and warm-hearted Hoos. Having been annoyed by Whoville's noisy Christmas festivities for 53 years, I think that's how we know that he's 53 years old, the Grinch decides to stop Christmas from coming. He disguises himself as Santa Claus, travels to Whoville on a sleigh with his dog, Max, that he dresses as a reindeer. The Grinch slides down the chimney of the first house on the square. He steals all the presents, the food for the feast, and the Christmas tree. He's briefly interrupted in his burglary by Cindy Lou Who, a young Who girl that concocts a crafty lie to help his escape. After doing the same to all the other houses, the Grinch takes his sleigh to the top of Mount Crumpet. He prepares to dump the stolen belongings into the abyss. As dawn breaks, he expects to hear the Who's crying, but is shocked to hear them singing a joyous Christmas song instead. The Grinch comes to realize that Christmas means a little bit more than just presents and feasting, causing his shrunken heart to grow three sizes. The reformed Grinch returns to the Who's, their presents and their food, and he's allowed to take part in their Christmas feast. He even joins them for lunch. So that's kind of a summation of the Grinch who stole Christmas. We're going to watch a little video, it's about nine minutes long, of um, my friend Matt Rawl and his first prison presentation of our study for today. So, Nate, if you would roll it. When you 
you hear or read the word Grinch, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Do you think of that strange green creature who lives on the top of Mount Crumpet? Do you hear Boris Karloff's deep bass voice describing the most miserable of creatures? Or maybe you're thinking about the person you just saw at Thanksgiving that never seems to have the Christmas spirit. Or maybe you're thinking about yourself. Whether you've read the original Dr. Seuss's How the Grinch Stole Christmas as a bedtime story or gathered the family together to watch the television special or hit the theaters for the many movie adaptations, you know how this story never seems to leave our imagination. How the Grinch Stole Christmas by Theodore Dr. Seuss Geisel opens with a sad, miserable, red-eyed creature loitering about the opening of a dismal cave. The Grinch is the sad creature who lives in isolation, seemingly happy with nothing, a miserable creature whose heart is two sizes too small. But should we hate the Grinch? Being a Grinch certainly isn't a term of endearment. But could it be that the Grinch is actually worthy of our sympathy? I mean, it's easy to push against someone who hates Christmas to such a degree. But what if we exchange the word Christmas with politics or Hawaiian pizza or Tom Brady? You know, anything you're not supposed to discuss around the dinner table with guests. In other words, if we take a moment to think about our own story, I'm sure we'll find something that we hate just as much as the Grinch hates Christmas. But Christmas? Really? With the music and the decorations and food and presents, how could anyone not love the Christmas season? And maybe that's why the Grinch has captured our imagination for so many years. The story tells us that the Grinch hated Christmas. And in the book, the word is italicized for emphasis. The Grinch wasn't just having a bad day. It's not that he received an awkward present under the tree or someone didn't give him an invitation to the office Christmas party. He hated Christmas. When reading this story to my kids, I always emphasized hated. And as if scripted, my kids had the same response. Their eyes got big. Their mouth turned down. Because the Grinch's hate for Christmas is unexpected. And surprising. And immediately we're left wanting to know more. We might think we remember why the Grinch hated Christmas, but actually we're never told in the original story. It would make sense if the Grinch had a bad Christmas memory or was ostracized by the seemingly joyous Who's, or maybe this is regrettably part of your story as well. Maybe Christmas isn't a joyful time for you because of tragedy or missed opportunities, or unexpected changes that meant your traditions would never be the same. But I like how Dr. Seuss makes the Grinch's hate ambiguous and left unanswered because hate doesn't need much of a reason to consume us. Which came first? His hate for the Who's or his hate for Christmas? Ultimately, I'm not sure it matters. You see, when hate seeps into our thinking, it distorts our vision like a circus funhouse mirror or a bad Snapchat filter. It takes what is beautiful, uses it as a weapon, and makes it ugly. Christmas is beautiful. Christmas is profound. Pondering the mystery of Christ's birth is never exhausted. But the Grinch's hate for the Who's meant that the only solution that would satisfy his small heart would be to take away what they love, use it as a weapon, and forever mar their memory. Memories are powerful, and because memories are powerful, there's a great temptation for making Christmas perfect. What might happen if we get the wrong gift, or our Christmas Eve sermon isn't clicking on all cylinders, or we burn the Christmas turkey, or Christmas Eve isn't just so? I won't say that Christmas is never as perfect as we imagine it to be, but I can say that perfection isn't a prerequisite for celebrating Christ well. The Grinch hopes that the joyful music of the season might be remembered as a clanging, discordant symbol. 
So, the Grinch developed a wonderful, awful idea. He was going to stop at nothing to keep Christmas from coming. Do you hate anything? We might think that hate is a bad word, but it's not without biblical precedent. God spoke through the prophet Amos against Israel's injustice and arrogance, saying, I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Is it wrong to hate? Maybe it depends on what you hate. Through Amos, the Lord also says, hate evil and love good. It seems counter to the Christmas message to mention the word hate. But if we light candles of peace, hope, love, and joy, that light is meant to dispel something. Lighting the candle of peace means we hate war. Shining a hopeful light means we hate despair's shade. A worshipful joy should stamp out our mourning. And a candle of love reminds us to let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. I'm convinced that few of us love evil and hate what is good. The problem is our definitions for good and evil can so often be confused. The Grinch assumes that stealing away what he thinks is Christmas will stop Christmas from happening. After returning from his midnight masquerade, he waits on Mount Crumpet for the weeping and wailing he feels certain will happen. He leans in to hear a sound coming from Whoville, but instead of wailing, he hears singing. And he's astoundingly surprised. Why didn't his plan work? He did exactly what he set out to do, and yet the outcome, thankfully, fell short of his expectations. Advent is a season of expectation, like a child holding her breath until Christmas morning. But our expectations and God's gifts often aren't the same thing. The manger is the throne of God, and it is disarming. We hear that the Messiah will be the Lord of Lord and the Prince of Peace and he shall reign forever and ever. And then like the shepherds, we find a child wrapped in swaddling clothes and we're amazed and totally disarmed. And when we are disarmed, we have created a space for peace. At the church I serve during the first week of Advent, we light the candle of peace because without peace, there is little time for hope or love or joy. Often, peace begins with the self, looking in the mirror, being at peace with the person that's staring back. Maybe that's why the Grinch is so gruff and angry and bothered by everything. Maybe he hasn't found peace in his own skin. After all, The Christmas story is how God entered into our skin and redeemed it. And if you can't look at your own reflection and recognize that what's staring back at you is a child of God, you might understandably detest the annual celebration of the incarnation because it is a reminder that God loves us more than we sometimes love ourselves and our neighbor. Or it could be that the Grinch's shoes are too tight. The Christmas story surprises us and disarms us, hopefully long enough to find peace, peace with ourself and peace with our neighbor. When we are at peace with ourself and one another, we begin to discover how exhausting and unfruitful hate is. But the Grinch, the Grinch isn't there yet. And as we will soon see, he is in for quite a journey. Okay, good job, Matt. Good presentation. Let's refer to our little handouts uh, because I want us to think and talk about these things. I prefer to have our studies in Paxson Hall. Paxson's not quite ready for us, but that was good for discussion, and I believe in those in the audience congregation to have some discussion. So what I'd like to do 
is if you feel comfortable, turn to some folks around you as we chat for just a couple of minutes about some of these questions that I want us to focus on. First one is this, like the Grinch, have you ever felt not so festive during the Christmas holidays? And if so, why? Um, in other words, what are some of the things that we just don't like about Christmas? All right, so chat about that just for a few minutes. A couple of minutes. Things we don't like about Christmas. I'll raise your hand, I'll call out on him, but speak loud enough for everyone to hear. What are some things that, that you just don't like about Christmas? That song goes, it's the most wonderful time of the year. For some people, it's not the most wonderful time of the year. Um, or at some, it is the most wonderful time, but they still dislike some things about it. What are some things? Well, the uh huh. People in it for a buck, the over commercialization, and um, that it starts early. Yeah. Okay. So much stress leading up to it. Presents, work, cooking, et cetera, et cetera. Over planning sometimes, uh huh. Anybody came up with some different ones? Heather? That can be one of the hardest things in the world. The first Christmas after losing someone is brutally hard because you know life is different. Mm hmm, exactly. Somebody else, those are good answers. Hate that we start Christmas so early. Hmm? Okay, those are good answers. In the original movie, the 30-minute movie uh, that came out, it has a different depiction of the Grinch than the book does. If you read the book or watch the YouTube presentation of the book, the colors of the Grinch are not the same as in the movie. In the movie, what color is the stuff the Grinch wearing? Green. That's not so in the original book. Why do you think the creators of the movie and then the Jim Carrey movie and any others that have followed has the Grinch wearing green? It's, it's so obvious, yeah. Green is the color of envy. And the Grinch was just very envious of everybody else. And I think that's the reason that the green color is there. Um, and then we have a question that we really don't know the answer to. But it's interesting for speculating. Um, the book says the Grinch hated Christmas, hated everything about it, but it never gives a reason why. Why did the Grinch hate Christmas? Say again? It, he had Max, his doggy, but lived up as a recluse up on that mountain and didn't join in with anybody else. Maybe that was a part of it. Perhaps a bad memory from childhood. He didn't know love the way the Who's knew love. Huh, Colonel? He was jealous of the people in the town. That's something to, to think about. I, I love in reading um, literature or even something as simple to read as The Grinch Who Stole Christmas, um, asking why. Things and, and really delving into it. So I think it's healthy for us to do it. Um, bottom line for us is that uh, the season of Advent is a time for us to get ready and make preparations for the coming of the Christ child in the manger. And as, I, as I'm preaching about today, making preparations also for the coming again of Jesus Christ at the end of time. Part of that preparation is knowing the story well. Um, not just trying to remember what the story of the Christ child and that first Christmas is like, but really knowing the story well. Uh, so I just encourage all of us to read the Christmas story found in Matthew and Luke um, over and over again and learn the story well, because that's really important. Um, somebody who did not know the story well was um, King Herod, who the wise men went to visit, and they just did not know the story well. Uh, and because of that, he hated what was going on. They came to him 
with a story of love and mercy, and he responded with hatred. And that happens a lot of times. Here's the scripture from Matthew chapter 2, verses 7 through 12. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men. He learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. And in parentheses, I put LOL. Yeah, sure, I'm sure that's the reason. You want to go back to Bethlehem and worship this newborn king. Not so. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they'd seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary. They bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. And you remember what Herod did when he found out? Mm -hmm. he, he had this massacre of killing all the baby boys two years old or younger in Bethlehem. So you have this great news of a newborn Savior, the, the King of the Jews being born in Bethlehem, and the response of King Herod was utter hatred. And that just reminds us that sometimes we can be presented with something that's beautiful and uplifting, and after we mull it over sometimes, our response is rejection and hatred. And we just have to wonder the reason why for that. The scripture passages that I want us to look at are on your handout. If King Herod had known about these and really thought about them and studied them, his reaction might have been very different from wanting to kill the newborn king. Uh, the first one from the prophet uh, Isaiah chapter 9 verse 2. It's a prophecy about the coming Messiah. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. What hopeful words of good news are found in that? Great light. I mean, it talks about darkness all around, but hey, don't worry. A great light has been born. Any other one? Dawn, a light has dawned. It's just beginning to rise. So good things are getting ready to happen. Hope is coming. The Messiah has been born. But King Herod, he perceived it as a threat to his kingdom. And he wanted no threat to his kingdom. He was not getting it. And so he wanted the murder of that baby. Then also from Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. For to us a child is born. And remember, this is pointing to Jesus. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. What words of good news are in here? Let's say some. Okay, that the Lord is going to take care of this. The Lord will accomplish it. Look at the names of the child. He will be called Wonderful. He'll be called Counselor. He'll be called Mighty God. And Jesus was God who became a human. He'll be called Everlasting Father. Like in the Gospel of John where Jesus said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. I and the Father are one, part of the Holy Trinity. He'll be called Everlasting Father. And one of my favorite names for Jesus, Prince of Peace. Any other words of good news that you see in there? I see two others. That's it, justice and righteousness. That it's going to be a new day that's coming. This little baby that's born is going to bring justice and righteousness to the world. Ah, that's another one. There'll be no end to his kingdom. This is not something temporary. It's not something that's going to, going to go away overnight. There's no end to his kingdom. 
Then let's look at Micah chapter 5, verse 2. This is a prophecy in the Old Testament about the Messiah. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. So the Old Testament, uh uh-huh, Bob. He was perceiving it as a threat, um, and in looking back through history, we know that Jesus' coming was not a political kingship that he was doing, but a spiritual kingship, but Herod was threatened. He was thinking it was someone who was vying for his throne. But the Old Testament has so many prophecies about the coming Messiah, one of which is where Jesus was going to be born. And that's why he called the wise men. He asked them where the Messiah is going to be born. He said, Bethlehem, they showed him this. They were perceiving one thing, a king to come and save the world, to bring peace and justice, but he was perceiving a threat to his throne. Um, And that just reminds us, sometimes good news can be met with incredible hostility. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of saying a location of the town, Bethlehem Ephrath, it kind of pinpoints it. Lafayette, Acadian country, something like that. Lake Charles, southwest Louisiana. The Grinch did that. He saw all this good stuff, all the greenery and the happiness coming around, and he sneered at it, and he wanted to take it away. Hate takes what's beautiful and makes something ugly out of it. The Grinch is an example of that. King Herod is an example of that. I guess sometimes we, we hate what we don't understand. You ever encountered that in your life or in the lives of other people? We don't understand something, and our response is not to try to understand it, but our response is to hate something that we don't understand. And the Grinch, even though a fictitious character, is one of the worst examples of that, of somebody who hated something that he could not understand. Uh, sometimes our expectations are really different from the reality. Um, The Grinch wanted to stop Christmas, but in reality, he couldn't stop Christmas. Even when all the presents were taken away, they sang, they forgave him, they invited him to the feast, and that's a powerful example. Um, I'm seeing that clock there, and I told Emmy 1035, and it's 1037, Um, but they seem to be calm and peaceful, right, Millers? Everything's calm and peaceful? Okay, good. They're going, we don't know. Um. Think about three people, not going to ask you to answer, but think about these three people and what they may be expected in contrast to what really happened. Think about Mary, this young girl who was pregnant, the gift of the Holy Spirit, knowing that she was going to be giving birth to the Son of God. Think about Mary, what she expected and what really happened. Think about Joseph the earthly father of Jesus, what he expected and what really happened, and then think about King Herod, what what he expected and what really happened. Those are all three key players in the drama, Mary, Joseph, and Herod. I'm going to preach on Joseph the carpenter in a few weeks because so often we don't talk much about Joseph, and Joseph played an integral role in all this. Uh Uh-oh, now Emmy's in the back of the room and she's breathing heavy. Stomping her feet. Okay. Um, We're going to close with a word of prayer. Next week we'll do session two. If you've not read, it's kind of like reading War and Peace, uh, The Grinch Who Stole Christmas. Uh, Not really. It'll take you all of um, five minutes to read it. But it it really is a a good little book. It is. Uh, And and like I said, you can watch it on YouTube as someone reads it and flips the pages, and it's pretty neat. So we'll continue our study with Matt Rawl on the Grinch Who Stole Christmas, the heart that grew three sizes. And it's our prayer as we get ready for uh, Christmas through the season of Advent that our heart will also grow three sizes. Let's join together in our closing prayer. Heavenly Father, you alone are the author of true peace. We praise you for choosing to live with us and to be with us. Help us to experience your peace this season and to embrace the light you so brightly shine 
so that we might pass on that light to others. Amen. Thank you all for being here today. Look forward to next week.